Well, first, I'm going to first give a little introduction of the people, each person. They're going to tell you about their organization. But before they tell you that, they're going to tell you what they want you to leave here with. What is their one message that they want you to leave here with? And my one message is that Fannie Mae, we, we own, we end up guaranteeing, backing, supporting one out of every four homes in the country. And when disaster happens, it happens to, to properties that, that we have in our portfolio. And we don't want to just rebuild the homes in our portfolio because if you only rebuild one out of every four, the ones on each side of you are not back and it's not a community. So we approach what we do from an idea of how can we help the whole community rebuild and be more resistant, be more re resilient, be more mitigate in a way that makes sense. That's my message, that's me. Now we'll go, or is it, are the slides in this order? We'll find out, huh? Valerie, Valerie's first. Valerie is from Southern California, outside of San Diego. Valerie has, has worked on a number of rebuilds. Uh, she herself got active in the, I gotta look at it so I make sure I tell you the right one. Um, she, she volunteered to coordinate her community's response with the Countrywide Regional Recovery Group after the, the, the Witch Creek uh, wildfires. Um, she's, she, she is ex Deputy Executive Director of United Policy Holders. She has been there for many years. She's on the board, the leadership, of, the leadership team, San Diego VOAD, the National Aging in Place Council, and, and runs the, the uh, Roadmap to Recovery for United Policy Holders. Valerie? Tell us something about UP and what's your message for people today? All right, so, am I live? Do we? Testing? Yeah. Switch it over. I have no reading glasses on. So. On. There. there we go. Sorry, no reading glasses, so I can't see those little buttons very close to my face. Um, so, so as Tim said, um, I, I met UP, uh, United Policyholders, when my community burned in 07. That's back when we called them 100-year fires. Um, then we had the 03 uh, Cedar Fire, which was the first 100-year fires. And then four years later, we had that second 100-year fire. Then they started calling them mega fires. Um, and so um, I, I met UP when I was running my community's recovery for about 500 people who lost their homes. Uh, United Policyholders came in with that Roadmap to Recovery program Tim was talking about, and they put together this uh, nicely curated set of how do disaster survivors from a wildfire move forward to recovery. And as I was doing the community piece, I plugged in, and I liked them so much I volunteered, and then I came on as staff. And I've been on the staff for, uh, I guess, three or four years now. So United Policyholders, we have three programs, that Roadmap to Recovery that helps people post-disaster, um, our Roadmap to Preparedness, which includes our, let me get the acronym right, uh, Wildfire Risk Reduction and Access, As Asset Protection Program, RAP, um, and then our Advocacy in Action. And we work in all 50 states to pull these pieces together to help people with insurance and then that overall disaster recovery piece. And the one thing that I'd like for all of you to take away is that most, for most people, your home is your largest asset in your portfolio of assets. And we wanna make sure that you are adequately insured and protected and you're doing all the steps to protect that asset because for most people that don't have that covered, it is, it is financially and life devastating. Jackie. Yeah. Okay, on, on your table are pieces of paper that are forward looking and two pieces of paper that are flipped over. Jackie is with Manny, Money Management International. I always have to, nah, nah, nah. I just call it MMI. Um, known Jackie for a while, she's from Louisiana. Jackie lost her home in Hurricane Rita and so often Hurricane Rita was called the, the, the forgotten storm. It happened right after Hurricane Katrina and, and Katrina took all the media, took all the attention and Rita was so devastating to Southwest Louisiana and, and Jackie is part of MMI, that, that one of the largest counseling, HUD certified counseling operations in the country. Uh, 
Disclaimer, Fannie Mae works closely with MMI with our disaster response network. MMI, they provide the counselors and the training. Jackie, tell us about MMI and tell us the one thing you want everybody to know. So the one thing I want you to know and remember later when you leave here is Project Porchlight, and you probably see one of these on your table. So Project Porchlight was a brainstorm that we had. Uh, following the 2017 Hurricane Harvey, our corporate headquarters was impacted, but so were a lot of our employees. And because we're the largest credit counseling agency in Texas, we saw a lot of consumers who were impacted by Hurricane Harvey, and we noticed some common themes among these folks. One of the things that stood out across all of these folks was they were using credit cards to sustain themselves after their disaster. So we all know that disaster, whatever kind it is, there's something we have in common. We all need time and we all need money to recover. And so there is such a, a lapse in time between the time uh, FEMA comes on board or you know, the other funding sources, folks turn to whatever they have, and in a lot of cases, it's credit cards. We also saw that these people had mortgage issues and that they did not know what their mortgage is, uh, options were. You'd be surprised at how many people do not know after a disaster that they can get a mortgage forbearance. And so we're counseling with people, helping them uh, make these decisions and not spend money that they shouldn't spend before they've explored all of their options. Um, it also applies to renters. Renters are unique in disasters in that they often don't have a place to come back to and their needs are sometimes forgotten. Um, so with the help of Fannie Mae, we formulated this new counseling protocol called Project Porchlight so that we could address the needs of disaster victims. It's a different financial counseling, although it is still financial counseling, in that you've got to take a person who could be, literally we've gotten phone calls from somebody who was evacuating, wanting to know where the nearest shelter was, to someone who is a year out, has spent their insurance money and made maybe not the best of decisions, and now is trying to figure out how to rebuild. So, we're that empathetic voice at the end of the phone who is there to answer the call, step this person through the process, and be their advocate wherever they need an advocate. Maybe they need to file a FEMA claim. Maybe they need to file an appeal. Maybe they need to file an insurance claim. Maybe they need Valerie. So that counselor is going to work with that person for 18 months to get them over you, the You home. said that counselor. So yes. when I call, is that I, I get a different... No, you're gonna get a single counselor. So if you get connected with Jasmine, as Linda did, she's on your table, you're gonna have Jasmine for 18 months. She's gonna know your story, she's gonna know your issues, and she's gonna work with you as long as you wanna stay engaged up to that 18 month period. And honestly, if you wanna stay on beyond that, we'll keep you on too. So all I wanna say is that there are resources for case management for people who do not know how to recover on their own, and we're one of those. And so take our literature, take my card, and be sure when you're working with consumers who just don't know where to go, and it's beyond your ability to put all of the pieces together, there's an advocate who can help them recover financially and move forward in their rebuild process. Molly, um, I, I first have to say, Molly, another disclaimer, Molly is on the board of After the Fire, so very <laughs> important here. So, uh, but Mo Molly is, is executive director for the nonprofit organization Community Wildfire Planning Center and founder of Wildfire Planning International. Um, Mo Molly didn't think one degree was enough. She went back to, to MIT and got a second degree. So, you know, you've got to kind of understand that, that she's, she's very intellectual. Um, she's based in Colorado. And, and, and even though she's based in Colorado, she knows a little bit about California. And I'll let her tell, talk something about that soon. Um, and, and certainly California land use plans. Um, but, but she works with a number of communities, but I'll let Molly tell us the one thing you want everyone to remember and walk away with, and tell us about the Community Wildfire Planning Center. Thanks, Tim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we founded, when I say we, uh, myself and my colleague, Kelly Johnston, 
We co-founded a nonprofit organization in 2017 called the Community Wildfire Planning Center, which was born out of working with different communities at the time in Colorado um, on voluntary programs that the Vail Board of Realtors and Eagle County were interested in. If anyone has ever been skiing in Colorado, you've probably been to Eagle County, um, Vail, Breckenridge, um, or excuse me, not Be Breckenridge, Beaver Creek. So we, at the time in the mid-2015 era, were getting questions about insurance. Uh, what we were also hearing from fire departments was they were saying, we keep getting contacted by our homeowners, their insurance companies are contacting them, they're not getting insured, their insurance is getting raised, they're getting these letters that want us to say, you know, go out, can the fire department go out and see if they're, um, if they meet some type of standard. So we started recognizing it wasn't efficient for fire departments to have to send out someone or write a letter every single time a homeowner called to ask what their insurance status was. Um, so we created a voluntary program that communities, some uh, fire protection districts and departments in Colorado as well as Eagle County and other jurisdictions use to do an assessment program very similar to wildfire prepared. Same concept, same science, it's based on IBHS science. Um, so that is one way we've worked with communities, just recognizing what that need was. As a land use planner, I also get the fun task of talking about regulations with communities. Um, you know, the number one question I get, especially when reporters call, is why can't we just not build there? Why are you letting, you know, not me personally, but you know, why are communities letting homes get built in the WUI? So my takeaway is it's a lot more complicated than that. I know everyone in this audience probably knows that, but I think there's a lot of work to be done to helping others understand there are, there's a spectrum of wildfire hazard, there's a spectrum of mitigations and risks that communities can address. Um, and so I don't think it's a simple answer to just say, let's just not have people build there. So we can talk about that more, but we focus more on the how. What are the practical ways that communities can address risk through plans, codes, ordinances, standards, um, and then with existing development, we support programs like what Elster was talking about in our programs to really address at the um, homeowner level the existing development as well. And I think if, if my math is right, Alistair, you're the next one. We, I think we've got your intro. We know about IBHS. What's the one thing you want everyone to walk away re remembering? What's your one message? Second URL, www.wildfireprepared.org. Take a look. Okay, now if I do, okay, it does, it, it worked. Um, this is about insurance. And, and when we think about rebuilding, we think about you know, all the help from FEMA, all the help from, from uh, the federal government, from, from CDBGDR, from HUD, from everywhere. But the number one source of funds on rebuilding is gonna come from insurance for homeowners. And that's what we have to keep in mind. And, and rebuilding, the, 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 the big question is, what is going to happen with insurance? What's the, can I get it? For the most part, I think you can. The question is, how much? Um, I, 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 I'm from Fannie Mae. I'm not from Washington. Um, I live outside of New Orleans. And, and I started my disaster tour uh, when I was 11, when we lost our home on the coast of Mississippi with Hurricane Camille. And then my parents lost their home again in Katrina and on and on and on. So, so, so one, as Maria I think earlier called me the director of disaster, it's followed me my whole life. But it's also made me understand what people go through. I have one question for Valerie. What's the state of the insurance market, especially when it comes to perils like fire insurance? Well, it, it's interesting, right? It's interesting. Let's just say uh, we are in uncharted uh, territory right now uh, that's, that's been growing over the years. So California, I would say, is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, yeah, going back to those uh, mega, mega fires before they were really called mega fires in 03 and 07, um, after those, the, uh, you, people were getting dropped right and left. You couldn't get insurance, and then the market stabilized. 
and, and then another round of fires and, and to the point that our insurance commissioner has a couple of tools at his disposal now. Uh, we put in a moratorium every time there is a fire in a community and all the impacted zip codes, you're not allowed to drop, the insurers are not allowed to drop anybody for coverage for a year. Um, just to give them time to recover while they're handling their other business. Um, and just recently, regulations passed, it's called Safer from Wildfires, um, and California's the first in the nation to require insurers to provide a discount uh, to encourage and reward residents to kind of incentivize them to take those mitigation steps like Alistair's outlining that IBHS is doing. And so the department, um, oddly enough, in 2000, right as COVID hit, the Department of Insurance in California and CAL FIRE, the, the statewide fire agency, were both on parallel tasks to develop a, a set of mitigations that would um, qualify for that discount that I'm talking about. Um, and and uh, you know that serendipity moment was IBHS. All three of them rolled out their mitigations at the same time within a, within a month of each other. And for once, the science and the the activities of everyone aligned. These are the steps that I that Alistair has outlined that everyone in this part, excuse me, the state feel will protect people from wildfires. So having that information, the question of our panel of can you get insurance, the answer is yes, right now. Um, so it's a qualified answer. Yes, you can get insurance. What you're gonna pay is gonna be highly variable depending on where you are. Um, as uh, Molly said in, in Colorado with the work we did in those early wildfires in the early 2010s, um, that market contracted and then it expanded back out and now there's fears after the Marshall Fire that it will contract again. And all the Western states are looking at this. I know Jennifer's work and with the, um, all the, the Western regions, they're looking at this issue. So um, it, we need IBHS and we need this, this proactive space to provide a space for insurers to stay in this market. We want them here, they're, they're our partners. Um, and we're all working together to get these solutions and we want those premium discounts. We want that improved rate scoring. You know, uh, The artificial intelligence right now, it's uh, not as robust as it could be, but you know, when you get to the point where you can look at a property with drone technology and say, okay, this property is protected, we're doing that flyover, three houses down, you know, being able to set, separate your risk from your larger block district, think your CDBG areas, um, to literally the, this home and two houses away, and your risk is moderate, yours is high, to be able to make it uh, truly reflect the hazards on that property and the surrounding area. Um, I would recommend those homeowner, the, the non-renewal protections, um, and creating homes that are less likely to burn, right? Um, so. So looking at that, qualified, yes, you're gonna have insurance. The reality is the market is going to change to reflect this partnership between government doing their part to mitigate risk. And I say this from my fire in 07 where my neighborhood burned because the water department had not taken care of their brush for 25 years and they burned straight in the heart of my HOA. Um, you know, and I had a friend who, who died from that. So um, government has to be part of that. They have to take ownership of their property, their parcels. Uh, the insurers doing their part to make sure that um, what they're, they're incentivizing people to do this versus dropping. Um, and then, you know, for the homeowners taking those proactive steps to do this, and that might take grants, Marin County in California, just over on the coast, did a bond measure to, substan to fund that effort. There's lots of tools that are a toolkit to make this happen, but we need to make that happen because what we're finding right now, and that's that qualification is, um, when I say qualified, yes, 73% of the California homeowners who've been dropped from their insurer were dropped because of wildfire risk. In California, we're lucky in that we have our insurer of last resort, the California Fair Plan. It's not a complete policy. It doesn't cover your contents, your ALE. You have to get a difference of condition policy to cover those gaps, but it will insure your home up to a certain dollar amount. So that's a great tool, but it's an incomplete tool, and we're the only ones that have that right now. Alistair, um, I, I love the whole concept of mitigation and resiliency, you know, but, but when I buy a house, I, I, want, I want stainless steel and, and, and marble countertops, and, and I, 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 there's no 
there's no envy for, for resiliency. Uh, you know, resiliency envy isn't something that, that's really priced into that home or the value like, 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 like people are looking for. What's the most resilient home? That's what I want. Not only do you need to change that, okay, increase resiliency envy, you also all these great ideas, don't they cost a lot of money to build to these standards? Isn't that just kind of out of the market expensive? So I would say th there's a couple of answers to that. Um, the f um, so there's a, f I would say, you know, human nature is at play here. There's a resistance to change. There's an assumption that change is bad. And I'll just give you one example, then I'll get to some of the numbers, is um, people, some people have a very strong reaction to removing vegetation their grandmother's flowers, or shrubs that they've, you know, they have tended for lovingly over the years, they, they think that they have to rip them out of their zero to five. And the fact of the matter is, shrubs grow better when they're away from your house. When you look out your window and you see the cobwebs and you see the dirt and the dust that's accumulated on your windows because you can't get there to clean them, and part of the shrubs have died because they're too close, they don't get enough sunshine, they grow a lot better five feet out. Nobody's saying you have to get rid of your shrubs, you just have to have some imagination. Plus, you don't have to water the side of your house when they're five feet out. So that's on that kind of thing, the, the change, I think we'll start to see more and more acceptance of, of those types of things that don't cost very much at all to achieve those mitigation measures. In terms of building, um, we, there's a report out, if you haven't seen it, it, we released it a couple of weeks ago. It was a joint effort between IBHS and Headwaters Economics, who have done a number of uh, cost analysis for us over the years uh, for the various mitigation programs. And what they'll tell you is that uh, they looked at three levels of mitigation. So the, the bottom level is roughly Chapter 7A, Building Code, California, right? Uh, the next level up is roughly Wildfire Prepared Home Base, and then the top level was Wildfire Prepared Home Plus. And what they found was that uh, in California, and these were costs based in 2021, so there were probably elevated costs due to pandemic concerns, um, that you could, you could achieve the 7A level, the base level, with as little as $3,000, depending on if you wanted stainless steel rocks, or if you wanted something more organic. So uh, the next level up was the, um, was the base, Waffle Prepare Home Base, and we saw between a two to 8% increase in hard costs um, if you're building to that standard. And again, there are some, there's some wiggle room there. And then the, the ultimate level, the plus level, was four to 13%. That's pretty consistent with what we see in the Fortified Program too. Fortified, to get to the fortified gold level, you're looking at about a 3% increase in, in material costs. Just to, um, just to add to that, that does, the, the California standard does include a class A roof. So that is an expense that if that's not a requirement in your jurisdiction's building code, you would add that onto that. But to put what he said in perspective, those numbers, uh, two, I checked with our office yesterday, had two homeowners uh, calling in to find a, additional sources of insurance because their premiums had increased. One went from $1,800 to $9,500, a 500% increase. The second person who reached out to our office yesterday went from $3,600 to $14,000. That $10,000 and that premium for one year will pay for those mitigations. So it is so worthwhile. And insurers are starting to encourage people, we're gonna drop you if you don't do these things and we'll even help connect you to the, the, uh, the contractors that can do that work for you to make that happen. Molly, California land use, what do you know about it? Too much. Too much. <laughs> um, well, thank you for prompting me to put in a shameless plug for a recent report we finished with the Office of Planning and Research. It's called the WUI Planning Guide. It's available on OPR's website, and we profiled a number of best practice case studies from jurisdictions across California 
on anything from landscape ordinances. Napa County is actually one of the um, case studies we did, so thank you if we interviewed you. Uh, we also looked at Santa Barbara and their assessment district, so how do they finance some of their wildfire mitigation. Um, we tried to focus primarily on land use planning tools, but there is, as many things are with land use planning, it's related heavily with other departments, so how do fire departments, public works, building officials engage in the process as well. Um, we see, so I'm based in Colorado, although 90% of my time at this point is and work is in California. Because there's such a receptivity to land use, both A, because there has to be, because the state requires a lot of different um, general plan, safety element updates, pertaining to wildfire, as well as other, legis uh, excuse me, other ordinances that have to be followed. In Colorado, that's not the case. Um, I'm sure there are other people from Colorado. I think we tend to think of ourselves as being very, very progressive in many ways, but when it comes to minimum statewide requirements for the WUI, there are none, uh, which may come as a surprise if you live in California. Um, we don't have anything, and it's been a struggle. We thought we would after the um, 2012 Aldo Canyon fire. Um, there was some potential direction for that. And I think what it sets up is a dynamic where every jurisdiction is kind of on their own in Colorado. That's similar to other Rocky Mountain, Intermountain states where you know, there's certainly some success stories we've seen where communities have been proactive and in fact, we just profiled three communities in Colorado, Colorado Springs, uh, Eagle County, and Uray County that have adopted regulations. Um, and they didn't wait for a fire disaster in their area. They actually took this rare step of looking at what they could do before uh, wildfires were a significant threat. It, it, I should say a significant experience that they were recovering from. So I think what I'm trying to say is that we see a range of approaches at both the state and local levels across different states in the West. Um, we don't see really much in the South and Southeast for fire. Florida has adopted at the state level part of in their fire prevention code, but doesn't really get used for fire. Um, and so we, we do have a bias towards regulations as one of the tools that can be very effective. And at the state level, what makes it a practical tool is that everyone is playing on the same minimum standards playing field. And right now, in states that don't have any sort of statewide requirement, um, they're kind of, they're on their own and they can determine if they want it or not, but it's, there's an inconsistent approach and so it can be very difficult to know who requires what and why and, and so forth. Jackie. Yes. Jennifer last night was telling me that her credit score is 850. And, and I, I was like, I don't know what that means, this whole, Everybody. this whole, and, and, and then she showed me that mine was, was 580. And, and I, again, I didn't know what all this was. And, and help me with credit scores and, and disasters and insurance. Is, do any of those interconnect and do they matter? Sure they do. And you're in good shape and you need to talk to one of our counselors. <laughs> um, but seriously, so we know some things about how um, disaster impacted consumers are, are affected by their credit score. We know that if a consumer goes through a disaster, uses their credit card, does the things that they normally do on their own, the first year after their disaster, their credit score is gonna lose 25 points. You couldn't handle another 25 point loss. Um, we know that if they come for counseling and work with a counselor and go through an action plan and follow a step-by-step -step process and make good decisions about what to do with their money, we can keep their credit score even and we can help them gain 40 points on their credit score over the next two years. And you're thinking, who cares about your credit score when your house just burned down? But guess what? If you need to buy insurance, they're gonna be looking at your credit score. And if you need to make a loan, they're gonna be looking at your credit score. So your credit is just as important as the insurance policy, your rebuilding plan. You have to have a place to start and that credit score is incredibly important. Another piece of that is if you're working with a counselor, we can help you reduce your debt to income ratio by 
That matters when you're looking at insurance. It matters when you're building a budget to live off of every month. And it matters if you have to apply for a loan. 97% of the people who work with a counselor resume their housing payment within a year of a disaster. 96% of them have no late payments in the 12 months following the disaster. That's huge. But if I were to show you the difference in the person who didn't work with a counselor, it's not so pretty. So just remember these counselors are out here to be advocates to help hold people's hands, to help them make great decisions about how to use their money and make sure they're getting the right resources on the ground as they go through recovery. Thanks, Jim. Valerie, tell me, after the Paradise Fire, we, we, we kind of ran into each other um, in Paradise every now and then. Just explain to me what, what United policyholders did and tried to do for people in, in that fire. And, and, and what are you doing, say, in the Marshall Fire? Right. Yeah, so, so to, to elaborate a little bit on that Roadmap to Recovery program. So our, our name says it all. We're here to advocate for policyholders. So our Roadmap to Recovery, we, um, if pre-COVID we were doing everything in person, so as Tim said, we would run into him at um, workshops we'd put together. And uh, we have a, a workshop series that walks people through uh, from an, uh, an orientation, I'm getting ready to do one for the 2022 fires in the next two weeks with FEMA, Cal OES, and some other players. Um, we'll do an orientation just on, on getting people set up, queued up for recovery to how to read your policy, uh, how to, the mechanics of rebuilding, the finance of, of rebuilding, working, I'm doing a webinar on contents, not that anybody here wants to know how to do contents or could care about depreciation, but I'll be doing that at five o'clock today if you'd like to join me virtually. Um, you know, but uh, all these topics related to the mechanics of recovery. And, you know, just because we cover insurance doesn't mean we don't partner with Fannie Mae on how do you deal with your mortgage, the Builders Association on how do you hire a, a good contractor, how do you do a scope of loss. Uh, all of this technical information that if people have an insurance claim, it complicates their mental space in recovery. And so what we try to do is give them bite-sized action items that they can focus on, on a monthly, bi-weekly, whatever our schedule is. And that's what we were doing at Paradise, is just breaking it into small action steps that people could move forward. Because when you have a disaster, um, and, and Tim can, and, and Jackie can speak to this, you know, your real life is put on pause and you've inherited all of these other jobs. And if you're adding insurance to the mix, suddenly you've got, you know, a five more jobs that you don't know how to do and you're expected to be a subject matter expert on immediately. And so we're trying to create that space where people can do that. And it, it you know, it, it, it varies from these webinars to on our, on our website, we have something called Ask an Expert. If you go to our website, uh, www.uphelp.org, UpHelp, not uh, United Healthcare. Um, if you go to that, you'll see there's uh, probably more information than anybody ever wanted to see. Um, and so for those people or people who are Luddites like myself, we have a yellow uh, recovery book that we'll mail to you wherever you are. Um, and, and these are like guideposts to keep people moving, resources to keep them moving. And when they get stuck, uh, we, we do case managers training, we sit on the long-term recovery groups, uh, we'll do uh, pro bono clinics, uh, we're running a pilot project for the Marshall Fire right now with insurance, uh, retired insurance professionals to help people sort out where they are without having to hire professional help to figure out what they're owed and how to move forward. And this is the idea of getting most of those people unstuck and then we've got a legal clinic queued up for December to help those people who have legal issues will be coming in with um, certified financial planners doing a, um, a financial decision-making clinic. I'm gonna pull Jackie in now that I'm sitting up here with her. I'm so excited to meet her. Uh, but we, we will do that CFP for people who are looking at, do I dive into my 401k? What do I do at that high level? You know, and using professionals who do this for big bucks all day, every day with clients who are volunteering their time to help people get unstuck. So, you know, that's, we're, we're kind of a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, um, I was talking to somebody from um, or Oregon earlier today and we were just talking about being that connect the dots kind of person. And, and, and that's kind of what UP is. We have our lane we stay in, it's a narrow lane, but we bring in all these other partners to make that happen. And is that what you were looking for, Tim? Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, 
Pam and Jennifer keep looking. Why did Tim grab the scissors? Oh. These are very special scissors. These are magic scissors. I'm going to hand them first to Alistair, and he's going to, to state the wish that he wants to make the world better when it comes to disasters and recovery and resiliency. And then he's going to pass it down. So, Valerie, you get to think about yours for a minute. Right. Alistair didn't know the magic scissors were coming. <laughs> no, he didn't, but he's got an answer. Um, persuade two people, and then have them persuade two other people about the benefits of taking action. Well, that's nice. That's nice. We can clap. You can clap. Yeah. <laughs> I would wish for more investment in existing communities that need to retrofit their infrastructure, which means their access, their water supply, vegetation management, uh, built environment. That would be my wish, that we are um, really focused on what is out there today already. I could explain more, but Tim probably wants me to keep handing the scissors down. <laughs> the magic scissors. <laughs> oh, my wish list is long. I would wish that really, truly consumers knew that they had help and advocates out there who will help them through this entire process. It's, it's painful, it's devastating, um, but we've created an empathetic team who can be there whenever they need the help. And, and there, there's lots of folks who want to help, but uh, we'll be there from the start to the finish. So information is key. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and for mine, and this is my personal wish, had nothing to do with UP, um, I, I'd like for us to have a no wrong door approach that no matter what door people come into working with you, if they've got needs in this space, you're directing them to those resources to make it happen because it's got to be a community effort. Uh, we, we can't do this siloed. Um, I appreciate Jennifer's messaging is, you know, her, she's a silo buster and, and, and they are and, and, and we have to be that. And so um, I, I would wish that for us that when someone comes to you, if you're not able to help, you're able to make that connection and that you always take that opportunity to reach back if you don't have it then to give it to them when they need it. And Tim, your magic scissors are back in, so now you get to say it. I cut up my credit score, yes. Um, my, my, my wish would be that when the disaster happens that, that all, we're able to, to gather together all fraudsters and, and put them in a special little place. Um, <laughs> Con artists and fraudsters and bad players, we've all seen them just explode after the event. And, and there is a special place in hell for them. Um, I've, been, I've been promised that. But, that, but that we, I don't want them to wait that long. I would rather have them there now. We have, we have about five minutes. I want questions. Questions. Yes, sir. I get my exercise, get my steps in. Thank you. For uh, Alistair, um, you talked about the zero to five foot zone and the connected fence. During my uh, wildfire mitigation consultations, I always recommend that, but I've recently looked at the fact that some of these fences are older, untreated six, seven foot fences. So I've actually been recommending 10 feet out because if that fence catches on fire and it's underneath an eave, that's a very bad situation. So is IBHS looking at extending that to, say, 10 feet, just to round it up? Uh, I'd rather get rid of the fence, period. Um, but anything, the five, five feet is a practical um, the, uh, distance. That's, we know that um, from the experiments that you'll see when you all go on ibhs.org, you can watch the, the experiments there with the, the, exactly what you're talking about. We know five feet works. Is 10 feet better? Sure. Um, will we change our guidance to require 10 feet? I don't think so, because we know a five feet is, is a critical uh, distance, and that's balancing kind of accessibility and practicality. Um, in some places, you know, with three foot setbacks, um, just being able to implement mitigation measures that will earn you a designation requires you to work with your neighbor because there's only six feet between your house. So there's some practical aspects to it too. Thank you, Kevin. 
Hi there. Introduce yourself. Hi, Tatiana Hernandez uh, from Boulder. Hi, Valerie. Um, we, we learned from our friends here in California and, and from others across the Intermountain West about um, just underinsurance being a universally huge issue uh, post mega fires in particular. I think my question for you all who've seen now multiple events, is there something fundamentally flawed in the insurance algorithm with respect to the damages that are caused by mega fires versus like, I left my stove on and my house burned down. Val, the question I have coming from Miami, it's like, is there a difference between water damage and flood damage? Is there a difference between fire damage and mega fire damage? I, I would say there's a, and Alistair, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a difference between an individual house fire and the level of devastation on a property versus a mega fire where the entire infrastructure can be destroyed. Um, th those look very different. And so uh, I'm not going to speak for the insurance industry. My experience is that um, the modeling is more geared towards not catastrophic loss, but just an individual loss. And so there's that piece. Um, I will say in 03 and 07, I saw a lot more people were adequately insured than I do now. And there's, there's certain uh, restraints on the market, um, on the industry, and they're, they're not allowed to overinsure, so they can't overinsure you, and that's, that's spelled out. So there's some regulators that have put that, uh, that, that stands, and so they're having to honor that. Um, you've got uh, price conscious consumers. And so, um, you know, from a, I have a friend who was in the industry, and, sh and she said her script was the longer somebody hesitated, the more she dropped the coverage because she's trying to get to the price point that they would say yes because they didn't want them good to go to someone else. And so, you know, it's it's a product, but I, I will I would actually defer to to Jackie from the standpoint of I think there is a dearth of financial literacy in this country and that people don't know how to adequately manage this risk mitigation tool. Um, you know, unless you grew up in my house, my kids are like incredibly overinsured as renters. They're geeks, right? They know this stuff. Um, but but they, they went to school of mom's hard knocks. So what they know is not what any of their friends know. And so they're educating other people on the importance of um, and, and how to be adequately insured. But, but that, that question of what it is, it, 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 when you're dealing with a catastrophic loss, there's a whole nother level of cost because, you know, uh, Coffee Park, you're looking at thousands of homes destroyed in the area. You've got surge capacity. My fire, China was doing the Olympics. You couldn't buy sand. I live in San Diego. How can you not buy sand? They were shipping it to China to build concrete structures for the Olympics. Uh, you know, we had COVID. We've had all these other things. And so all of those pieces play into this. Um, and, and it depends on you as a homeowner to know that you can ask for more. Um, you know, those extended replace, uh, the, the extended code upgrades and extended replacement cost coverages that you might have, they're going to offer you the default unless you say you want more protection. And you have to check your policy every year. I just updated mine. It had always been 20%. And when I called and had my three hour conversation with my guy because we were geeking out together, um, you know, I found out, oh, there's a 50%. Yes, I want the 50%. Oh, really? It's going to cost me $100 more a year? Yes. I wish you'd told me that five years ago. But, you know, it's, it's there if I had bothered to read the policy, right? We're all busy. So there's that piece. And, you know, with Jackie dealing with, with uh, people in the financials every day, I think there's a large part of that consumer education on all pieces. So the preparedness piece of what we do matters. Um, when people get that loan, they get insurance, but are they getting the right kind of insurance? I had somebody for the CZU fire in 2020, the lightning strike fire. She had just closed on her house and moved in two days before the fire. She was a half a million dollars underinsured on her loan, on her loan, because remember she bought land and a house. But her mortgage, I mean, excuse me, the price to rebuild was gonna cost her $750,000 because she needed an engineered foundation, she was on a hill, and we don't know to even ask those questions to give that information to our agent. 
And so, and, and I'd love to pass it back to Alistair because I think he knows more of what the, the industry knows. I will just say before I pass it over though, the fact that the industry is pushing this along and coming up with these standards is huge. Because pre-COVID, when, when we were presenting with the, the national lobbyists for the insurance industry, they, they, they said it might take, that science takes time to get, it might take another 10 years before we get it. We've got it now. It's rolling out in paradise, and that is amazing for it to move that fast. Alistair, we'd love for you to talk about rates and individual markets and, and, <laughs> and, and work across uh, all insurance companies, but Jennifer has told me we're out of time, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's going to have to be a private conversation. But uh, oh, I, would just, I would just say this, uh, that I'll stick closely to our building science lane, but there are some people here that understand containment. Um, and I'd ask, I would ask them the question, the, the big difference from a cat and an individual uh, house, house fire, what the risk is, and is it all about containment? Thank you. Working great.